I'd like to call to order the uh, June 1st, 2009 meeting of the East Ascension Gravity Drainage District Number 1. Uh, roll call, Madam Secretary. Be it known that uh, we have some folks absent. Uh, board Member Pat Bell is out of town. Adrian Thompson, <coughs> Chris Lohr, and Dennis Cullen. Right now, I'd like to announce to everyone in the audience that uh, for public comments speaking, if you would wish to speak on a specific item on the agenda, please come forward to the podium and fill out a, uh, a slip, and you will be given three minutes. Thank you. Um, <coughs> we move on to item number four. Acceptance of the minutes of the May 4th, 2009 meeting. So moved, Chairman. Yeah. I second. We have a motion by Mr. Mr. Valentine, second by Mr. Johnson. Any discussion? Any opposition? Motion carries. On the chairman's report, I don't have much to report. Mr. Rue will and uh Parish administration will bring you up to date on the capital projects. It's probably one of the okay. things that we have going right now that I'd most like to hear some discussion about. Yes. I, I hate to do this. Go ahead. We need to pray and do the Pledge of Allegiance. Oh, yeah. We definitely need to pray. And we have Mr. Lohr in. I may ask that everybody bow their heads. In the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We pray that our meeting tonight will find some resolution to the issues that plague the people in Ascension Parish and the surrounding parishes. We ask you for wisdom and guidance. Tonight we have a special prayer for the Mr. Virgil LeBlanc, who's deceased, the father of one of our fire chiefs, and Constables James LeBlanc, we ask that you pray for the LeBlanc family, everyone. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. With that being said, we'll move right into agenda item number six. On agenda item number six, we have several speakers that had earlier requested to speak. We have uh, uh, representatives from the Iberville Parish Council that are here that would like to address this board. And uh, first of all, we have a, a presentation by Lane. Please state your name and who you represent here, sir and ma'am. I'm Kathy. I'm Kathy Hager. I'm with Riparian Incorporated, a wetland company, and my husband uh, is a co-operator of that company. Okay. Uh, tonight we're representing Lane and presenting information on the basin that we hope will enable you to make good decisions. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Can I start now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's go. Okay, uh, just some navigation information for the three, three pictures that we're gonna show. And I need to step through this. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to talk. Yeah. Whoops. There we go. Um, what we call the elbow is where bro turns into alligator. There's one picture there. Whoops. Should be on. Try it again. Well, it's, it's not Brandon and Lester's fault because they gave me some OJT. I guess I'm slow on it. Okay, there's the elbow. There's where one picture is. And then the next picture is, oops, doesn't like moving the mouse or doesn't like touching the button, one of the two. Well, let me, yeah, 
things going on. Okay. okay. These are photographs of uh, this in the Spanish Lake Basin, uh, basically at the turn in Bro, the Bro Canal. And you can see this is what I'm going to be talking about. This plant right here. This is giant cut grass, as is this. Notice how small it was in October of 07 and how much more ground it occupies on tax day of this year. Um, we'd really like to tell you all good evening. We'd like to thank you very much for allowing us to make this presentation. Uh, we wish that uh, this information, you know, that our expertise will allow you all to make the proper choices with regard to the basin. I uh, would like to thank Brandon and Lester for hooking it up and letting you see the pictures. But um, we're, we're going to address two very critical issues. Um, and we think we have some experience here to, to bring to bear on, on this, on, on your drainage decisions as well as uh, how, those thing, how those decisions will affect habitat in the basin as well as flooding. Um, my background is basically, I've got two masters, one in geology and one in ecological biology. Kelly has a, is also a master's, but he has, he got a wild hair when he was 50 and went to law school and passed the bar in 05. So hopefully that combination allows us to see some things in a far ranging area. But more than that, Kelly served as a drainage board president in St. Tammany Parish for two years. So I think he really feels your pain. He knows how difficult these things can be. Uh, that said, let me, let me talk a little bit about giant cut grass. It's a, it's a plant that can grow anywhere from six to nine feet high. It has very sharp leaves, very, very sharp edges. It's like a serrated knife. It can move out 10 to 14 feet in a, if conditions are, are uh, conducive. And all it needs is sun, wet mud, and water that's less than two feet deep. This is what it looks like in the bayou this past 15th of April. Here's a little boat, and it's trying to get through that canal. The cut grass has moved in from both banks some 15 or 20 feet because the, because the bayous and canals are silted in and if the water is less than two feet deep, it's going to take over the universe. Here's, here's what it looks like. Here's what it looked like on May the 12th of this year. And it's the water, there isn't even that much water there now. You can't run a go devil in this. Here's the cut grass in these big clumps up here along the shoreline, former shoreline, and you could see how it was moving down into the, into the channel. Well, now that there isn't any water to restrain it at all, or any elevation, this, this cut grass is going to take these banks you can see it colonizing out in Cypress Flats. There's no water in Spanish Lake Basin, and the mud flats there will likely support cut grass as well. <coughs> A catastrophic change in hydrology caused this giant cut grass explosion. Cut grass wasn't even in the basin until Katrina put it there, likely in 05. At least that's to the best of our knowledge. But just raising the water level back to what it was last year won't control it. There are options and consequences to what you do to manage this basin. If you do nothing, if you don't spend a penny, the cut grass will choke off every bayou and every lake in the flats. And it'll eventually trap sediment and cause the water that would have occupied the channel to go sideways up onto the land. If it does that, it'll it'll likely it'll likely take it'll likely go around into the areas 
that people wanted to drain so they could grow their trees better. If the water can't stay in the channels, it's going to go elsewhere. Raising the water level back to four or five feet is another option. At this elevation, the water stays in the channels. If you maintain this level, cut grass can't get completely across the channels even in their currently silted in conditions. That'll allow some people and water to move around in the basin and maybe even control some of the cut grass. But dredging the bayous and canals is really, we believe, is the best option. That'll limit the cut grass to the bayous and canal banks. It'll uh, allow people to get in and control it in Spanish Lake and on Cypress Flats. And uh, the engineers will probably like that option too because it'll allow the water to get in and out of the bayou and the basin much better. And the food chain will be restored. Right now there's, there's precious little room for nutria or beavers or gators or anything else. Okay. Um, in sum, we hope that uh, whatever people thought that they were doing for the habitat in the basin, by draining the basin to zero water, whatever they had wished to achieve, it's not what's going to happen. The plan, in effect, is actually a management plan for maximum cut grass expansion. Draining the basin will convert the gaps and flats not covered by giant cut grass to willow and tallow forest. And out of sight, out of mind, these invasive <coughs> tree species will slowly invade and degrade the old cypress swamps and bottomland forests of the basin. Thank you for your time. Hey, two. Okay, two, two quick notes about, about flooding. The letter that uh, the mayor wrote on the 20th was about these four streets. The lock that's under discussion is way up here in the corner, and there are some blockages and some problems between the Sunshine area and that thing. Yes, just excuse me for one second. If Just to let everybody know, you're talking about the mayor. You're talking about the mayor of San Gabriel? Yes, yes, the letter that he wrote to their parish president on the right. on the 20th of April. Yes, because we don't have a copy of that letter right now. Okay. So um, just, I'm sorry I don't have one on me, but we can send you trying one. Trying to today. update everyone <clears throat> that's in the audience and <coughs> not sure how well this is going to show up. But this is this is the gauge levels for the days before and after the heavy rains, Saturday night the 18th and the Monday, uh, Sunday the 19th that produced that letter. The gate was open on every one of those days except the 19th when it was <coughs> closed. And that's because Alligator was trying to drain into Manshack. At the period of the highest level, it very briefly got to 6.3. So the, the streets that were attempting to be defended are over here in Sunshine. <coughs> and the elevation in that area is 22, 23. If you're in the middle of the, of the Bayou Paul Channel, the base flood elevation for building for FEMA is 21. Cypress Flats out here, if you zoom in on this. The, the basic problem here is the, the, the argument is, is attempting to be made that the top of, the top of Bayou Manchac Road is only about 12 and a half feet. To try to threaten those houses along Pecan that are at 12 and a half, the ones that are in Sunshine that are at 22, you'd have to have it rain enough to fill this entire basin. Up, once it gets to 12 and a half feet, it's going to go over the road. The, yeah, sump is important, but you get to a point where there's no change in risk. It's like I'm worried about a rabid dog because it's 100 miles away. If it moves 25 miles closer to me, yeah, I'm safer, but I'm still not exposed to any risk because it's still 75 miles away. You have people at 22 feet who are worried that a gate structure at 5 or 6 at the top of a road of a 12 is going to present a flood threat to them. It's just not possible for that to happen. In in recorded history, we had Allison put water over Manchac into the basin from East Baton Rouge. Now, does, does anyone know of any instance in 300 years of recorded history where it rained enough to fill the basin up enough? So there's, we, we think the flood threat attributable to Alligator Bayou, foot stomp, foot stomp, 
is greatly exaggerated. And thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And I just want to let everybody in the audience know that when you think some of us are not looking at you, we actually have individual screens right here. So when he's showing something up there, we can see it right here. All right. Uh, next, we have uh, a speaker from that was dedicated to at the request of uh, Mr. Bonifay and a request of his legal, but he's passed that on to the Lower Mississippi River Keeper. We have Paul Orr, Jr., is it? <coughs> Good evening, and uh, thank you for your time. Yes, Paul, please yes. let everybody know who you are, who I'm, you're representing here. Oh, sure. I'm Paul Orr. I'm the uh, Lower Mississippi Riverkeeper, and I am, I'm not technically a junior, but I'm, my father is the author of the paper that has been passed around to various people. Um, and, and just to address that real briefly, I, I my opinion is that uh, Bluff Swamp cannot be, uh, Bluff Swamp is Bluff Swamp. It's very different. It's hydro hydrologically disconnected from the Spanish Lake Basin. It's apples and oranges. We could talk about that all night, but it's what's good for Bluff Swamp isn't necessarily good for a Spanish Lake Basin or vice versa. Um, I have a PowerPoint. All right. So, um, so this is uh, we've been I've been coming out to uh, the Spanish Lake Basin uh, most of my life. Um, and recently, during the the new water regime, uh, we've been monitoring it fairly closely. Uh, okay. So, uh, my opinion is that the the new water regime is most certainly damaging the basin. Um, healthy fish habitat has been eliminated. Uh, there's almost no deep water anywhere in the basin. Uh, that I've been able to find. Here's an aerial photograph. This is uh, the dates on there. But it's kind of cut off. Um, I believe it was last Wednesday. Uh, so, you, so you can see that Spanish Lake is essentially dry. There's uh, really no water left. <coughs> um, there's another picture. It, it looks kind of like the moon. Uh, this is Spanish Lake before. Of course, it was a, a lake. Uh, those are coot or puldu. Um, when was that, sir? Uh, this picture. This picture. Uh, okay, I see it now. 328 I see okay. it now. March. Yeah, 320. Uh, so March 28th. Um, uh, the, uh, oh, I, I don't have, there should be another, a map, uh, but there's, you can look at the maps going back, you know, I think as far back as 1815. Uh, and you'll see Spanish Lake on the map. So we know that this lake has been there for a long time, and there's no uh, reason to believe that it it is empty a lot. So um, right now we're in the, the spring flooding still of the Mississippi. I think the Mississippi River crested last week at 40 some odd feet. Um, we know from the historical record uh, that that the Mississippi River flooded into Bayou Manchac uh, pretty much every spring, bringing lots of fresh water. Uh, this would have been a much wetter place back before the Mississippi was cut off. We also know that uh, this spring flooding is very important for the new migratory birds, uh, the neotropical migratory birds. They, the water is the, the heart of the wetlands. It's where the the crawfish and the crustaceans and the invertebrates that the birds eat, eat live, um, which supports the whole food chain all the way up. Um, so here's a, a picture. Uh, the, the tree line that you can see up near the top is, is Bayou Manchac. You can see on Plaquemine Point, which is not levied from the Mississippi River, it's, it's completely flooded. Uh, but of course, there's a levee blocking the water from Manchac. Uh, this is the flats uh, on, is that uh, October 19th? Yeah. Uh, and we, you get see black neck stilts. Uh, that was a painted bunning I saw the other day. Um, uh, snowy egrets, white ibis. And today, this is basically what they're faced with in the flats and, and in Spanish Lake. Um, 
I was out two weeks ago, I believe, on Saturday. A large flock of roseate spoonbills, I guess, well, not a large flock, I guess there were seven or eight, uh, came flying over and circled and circled and then took off back to the north. Um, uh, as, as Kathy said earlier, uh, the conditions now set up for noxic, noxious plant inundation. Uh, there's the cut grass, cut grass, the little rhizomes break off and float around and they start growing again. She went through that. There it is. Uh, there's me. So you can see it gets really, really big, like she said, up to nine feet or so. Um, and the wildlife is being harmed. Um, the, the mussels are, are some of the more endangered creatures in, in, in our wetlands. Um, they are an important part of the, the food chain, both their larvae and, and the adults. And uh, if you walk along, along the bayou edges, you see where there were little clam beds that are, that are now dry. And, and now the bayou is are so small and silty that it makes it really uh, not a very good condition for, for them. Uh, there we've seen uh, de there's not a whole lot of fish in there. The only fish uh, that I've really seen of any size left are, are bowfin and gar the, because they can tolerate the uh, low oxygen conditions, but we've seen a number of them. That, that's, this is the same bowfin. Uh, this is a gar. Uh, this is a different one. I couldn't get to it because of the mud. I think it might be a bowfin as well. Um, and then you've got all the other aquatic animals that depend on the fish, uh, like turtles and snakes and alligators and, and the birds. Um, so that's obviously a concern. Um, and then I think an important uh, point also is that this basin has been a public, a public asset for so many years, um, a place where countless people have hunted and fished and recreated. Uh, and, and it's really very difficult uh, I mean, you, really, you can't really get anything but maybe a small kayak or something in there. Uh, that's the water level today. Uh, it was right around 18 inches deep in uh, Alligator Bayou by Cypress Flats. Um, this, was, this picture was taken on March 28th. Uh, it's me in the 17-foot in the Boston Whaler. And then if you, if you keep an eye on the, the cypress tree on the right and these little trees on the left, you'll see the, the same spot. Uh, on May 15th, and uh, I'm basically right where the boat was. Uh, and so uh, that's the my presentation. I, I, I think there's no reason to have these sorts of conditions in the basin. Um, there's no reason to have them. The, uh, the landowners are complaining about flooding of, the, of their property. Uh, uh, from running up and down through the whole basin, uh, very little land is underwater above five feet, I mean below five feet. Uh, so I, I think that a, a suitable low water level can be found where no one's land is underwater, but you have a lot more water in the channels, you have water in Spanish Lake, <coughs> and uh, so that people can recreate and the birds and the fish have a place to live and the landowners can uh, have mitigation banks or whatever they, they're choosing to do. So um, I guess that's it. Thank you so much for uh, your t the time. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Orr. All right, we have, uh, we have a few speakers on this. Mr. Jim Gentry. Yes, my name is Jim Gentry. I live in East Everville on Highway 74, and I see that I mentioned it, make it out. Hello, George. Hello, there. Uh, thank you, thank you, people, for holding a meeting. They won't. Um, what has happened since Mr. Orso opened the locks is he's turned our beautiful bayous into stagnant ditches, and that's all they are. Mother Nature in Spanish Lake Swamp is suffering a horrible death right now. This very minute is suffering a horrible death. If water is not returned, East Everville and Ascension will lose one of the greatest treasures we have in this part of the world. If Baton Rouge thinks their blue bonnet swamp is something, this swamp here is a thousand times what blue bonnet swamp is. We're losing one of our, our biggest and best assets. And if our government allows this treasure to be destroyed, I have but one thing to say. 
May your God have mercy on your soul. That's all I got. Thank you, sir. We have uh, another speaker, Richard Condry. Hi, I'm Richard Condry. I'm an associate professor at LSU. I teach courses on historical ecology. I'm a resident of East Baton Rouge Parish. Uh, I was also a member in, um, excuse me, look at my Vita, 1998 and 2000 on the Bayou Manchac Alligator Bayou Spanish Lake Study Commission of the Louisiana Senate. I was interested in Alligator Bayou because it's a perfect opportunity for us to have um, a wonderful wetland uh, study area close at hand. What I want to convey to you is, is two points, and I have a, a handout that I can leave with you, is that in uh, 1699, Iverville slept at the convergence of Alligator Bayou, Bayou Fountain, and Bayou Manchac, and made an incredibly important decision that's important to the current United States. He decided to go on, even though the Native Americans had left him, to try and navigate at Bayou Manchac and prove that it was navigable because he needed to find two major forks in the Mississippi River for reasons I can't go into right now. He tells us that the flood mark from the pre previous year's flood was at five feet. That flood mark is higher than anything he records even as he enters the mouth of the Mississippi. The flood mark that he saw in the marsh was only four feet. The height of that flood mark is easily explained when we look at the 1908 U.S. Geological Survey map of the area. It shows the highlands surrounding the Spanish Lake Bayou Manchac, Alligator Bayou, Bayou Fountain area as containing the floodwaters of the Mississippi when they came in in the spring and also containing the red waters in the Spanish Lake area. The detail of that map is here, and I'll leave it with you. Leave it with the secretary, please. Please. And it shows that Spanish Lake. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you. You get three minutes, sir. So let's wrap it up. The detail here shows that Spanish Lake mm -hmm. was not an intermittent lake, but it was a permanent lake that Alligator Bayou and Bayou Bro were permanent bayous during that time period. And the trail sh that's shown through that area shows that the surveyors actually went into the area and recorded it as a cypress, as a swamp, which we believe was a cypress swamp. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker, uh, Casey Michael. Am I pronouncing that right? Yes. <coughs> Good evening. Um, my name is Casey Michael. I'm representing myself. And um, I just want to say that um, I have worked for Alligator Bayou in the past. And um, I feel like I have seen firsthand um, the treasure that it is. Uh, I think that it's very important for um, East Ascension Parish as well as um, just a, a beautiful treasure that has um, a whole, whole lot of life that um, should definitely be saved. And if it wasn't for um, Jim, Jim Ragland and Frank Bonifay, it wouldn't be where it is today. And they have um, pretty much given up their lives to create the business that they have or had. And um, I pretty much watched it grow and um, it was, up until this last year, it was um, a thriving business that brought people from all over the country to see it. And people were amazed and educated about the beauty and um, the life that was in those, those waterways there. And um, they also started doing tours um, for field trips for schools, which was wildly popular. And I mean, they basically had to start turning people away because they would book up a year in advance. And the education on those tours, I think, 
cannot be replaced. I mean, those kids were just had the time of their lives and on top of that they were learning hands on as they were there and I just think that um, it's a very important part of the parish and um, it's very important for to tourism here and that it should be kept um, as it was uh, as far as the locks are concerned pretty much every time it rained um, the person who was in charge of the lock came out and opened those locks. So, I mean, they were already tended to. It wasn't like they were just left closed at all times. And uh, as far as I know from my end, it was it was working fine. <coughs> and um, that's all I, I wanted to say. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank ma you for hearing me. Ma'am, are you a resident of Ascension yes. Parish? I live in East, East Ascension Parish. Yes, yes that's what I mean. <laughs> We have another speaker, Dale Clary. Hi, my name is Dale Clary. I live off Alligator Bayou Road. Um, I'm a Baton Rouge carpet bagger, but I'm glad to be here. Uh, I've watched Frank and Jim put together Alligator Bayou. They, they gave up their businesses to come down there and put this crown jewel in place. Uh, and now it's dry as a bone, and I had not seen those pictures that Paul Orr put up, and I'm shocked to see it, that Spanish Lake is dry. I don't think it has ever been dry. It certainly has not been dry in the years that I've been down here. And the thing that mystifies me is, okay, I can understand there's a dispute about we want some water here, but we don't want some water here. There's an ongoing study looking at that right now. Why do we have to shut them down now in something that could be permanent while the study is ongoing? I'm gonna, I happen to be an attorney who represents civil engineers, and I know civil engineers can do all kinds of things with water levels. It seems to me this is very, very fixable. You want to get some water off of here, you want to get some water into here, that can be done. Let that process go, close the locks, let's keep them under the same management that they have been under for years, there's no big hurry, let's see where we're going with this thing and then come back and look at it based on scientific evidence at the end of the study. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have another speaker, Nancy Crust. Crust? I don't want to mispronounce your name, man. Uh, Grush, G-R-U-S-A. Okay, it's a G, thank yeah. you. In a rush called Grush. <laughs> I'm here, um, I actually, I live in East Baton Rouge Parish, but I'm quite familiar with Alligator Bayou. I, I moved here from New Orleans in the 90s, and I'm with the Sierra Club, and that's how I came to become familiar with Alligator Bayou and when this issue came up I just couldn't understand why um, there was such a rush to open the gates. I understand that a lawsuit was threatened but in my opinion let the lawsuit be filed and let the experts discuss the facts <laughs> objectively. I understand that a study is now in ongoing and that it is due to be complete probably within a month. So again, I just don't understand why uh, we resorted to such um, action. Of course, maybe I do understand. When I first uh, came to Alligator Bayou, it was accessible only by a shell road, and there was not really any houses, there weren't any houses nearby. And um, now if you go along there, the road is smooth as glass. Cyclists love it. I'm one of them. <laughs> but, and, and, you know, I just figured that it was just a matter of time before development um, took this last jewel. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we have another speaker, Miss Florence Robinson. My name is Florence Robinson. I live in East Baton Rouge Parish. I'm here as a citizen who has come to know and love the Spanish Lake Basin. Spanish Lake and Alligator Bayou are priceless treasures, treasures for East Baton Rouge Parish, Ascension Parish, and Iberville Parish. Where else in the country can you virtually step out of your front door, drive a little ways down the road, and come into such a beautiful, wonderful, natural swamp system. I call it 
one of God's cathedrals. I go there oftentimes when I'm stressed by the world and I pray in God's cathedral. It is a place where children can go and see all types of birds, where children can go and learn to appreciate Louisiana's natural habitat. It is a place where our children can go and begin to understand and appreciate what their ancestors faced and how they coped and how they made a living out of South Louisiana. It is truly one of the most beautiful places I have ever been. And it is heartbreaking to see it being destroyed. I'm a former professor. I used to take my honors biology class of students to Alligator Bayou and put them in canoes. These were young people who had never, ever been in a canoe before. Though most of them were from Louisiana, they had never seen a swamp before. They were rather uncoordinated. Where else could I take these kids and put them in a canoe and say, let's go? Certainly not the Atchafalaya Basin, but I could do it at Alligator Bayou. And I could take those kids out, get them as far as the flats, make a circle, and in a few minutes, I could teach them all the basic concepts of ecology in a way that no book could ever do it. It's a very safe place, and many people take their children, or used to, take small children out there again, because it is so safe. Are we going to destroy this great treasure that means so much to the many for the benefit of a small number. It has been said that the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing or worse, to serve as the puppets of evil. When are we going to stop selling our sunsets? Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Our, our last speaker is Miss Tony Spillman. Miss Spillman. Hello. I am a 40-year resident of Beville Parish. I have lived on Manshack my whole life near Alligator Bayou. Um, the question that I pose to Iberville Parish or to Mr. Sanji is why did they take the drastic action of draining everything without looking at what was best first? We have a, I spoke to the uh, a property owner earlier that uh, he's owned the property for three years. We have families that have been back there for a lot longer than that that were never even considered. You have a business owner that was never considered there's never been, as far as I know, a public meeting or anything as far as Mitchell has called. I mean, he didn't even show up tonight. He had to send Mr. Sanji. He's never worried about flooding of the residents before until these landowners came in. So why, I pose the question of why he's worried about it now. And as everyone has said before, there, this is a big asset to all surrounding parishes, and it really needs to be looked at. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> all right, just to wrap this up, what we have is uh, uh, Iberville Parish. Am I going to get to speak? I, I never, I mean, I signed up to it. I don't, I don't see a card on you. You signed up? Yeah, yeah, I'm Joel Walter. We had 10 minutes. Yes, uh, I spoke to you quite extensively before the meeting about who was speaking on your behalf. You had my name? Okay. May I ask yes. three minutes? Please, I'll give you three minutes. Go ahead. And, you uh, and you know, I, I have my notes. I, I'm not trying to cut you short, but it's basically that you said that uh, these other folks will be speaking on, on your behalf. And uh, I think Maybe you misunderstood you had, me. I 
But that's okay. I'm sure. here. Let me go ahead. And go ahead. Do what I gotta do. Three My minutes. name is Joel Walter, and I'm representing Mr. Uh, uh, Frank Bonifay and Jim Raglan and the uh, Alligator Bayou Tours. Uh, tonight, you will be deciding the fate of the Spanish Lake Basin as it drives to oblivion and invites irreversible change. Tonight, we frame what is and what isn't at issue, and you've heard much of that already. Uh, what must be done now and what, uh, what may wait to a more informed decision later. Uh, tonight, we recognize your drainage responsibilities and uh, certainly would in no way minimize that. But we suggest that you move cautiously and incrementally uh, so as to minimize the damage to what you've already heard is one of South Louisiana's prized jewels. Um, draining the basin of all the, the water is not, in, in our view, a responsible or reasonable approach to the issues that we all face. On the one hand, you have those who want to drain the swamp. And on the other hand, you have those who want to leave some, but not a lot, of water in the basin, in the marsh, for the preservation of the Cypress lowlands. You heard already from experts and lay people about their views of the costs and the benefits of doing this. In some cases, the expert opinions, and we haven't heard them all, but they're going to conflict. And I suggest to you that we use our common sense and we listen to what the experts are saying uh, and, and ask ourselves whether it makes sense in our quest for an answer uh, whether the basin is worth saving and whether it's worth a minuscule increase in the factor in, in uh, the probability of risk that having zero water may in fact represent. Um, I will say up front that I proudly represent Alligator Bayou Tours. I also tell you that I'm extremely sensitive to flooding issues and I feel your pain. I lost my house and my, all my personal belongings in Katrina and we also, in New Orleans, I'm from New Orleans, and we have a world of experience with these things. Um, that being said, I listened carefully to what has been said, and just wanted to leave you with a couple of thoughts. The first is, the decision to leave the gates open has been given two justifications. The first justification is that the uh, landowners have sued, have threatened to sue other landowners, not Alligator Bayou Tours, has threatened to sue the, the parish if they don't do something. And the second justification is a drainage justification. We've already heard eloquently about the different elevations, and we can understand. We learned in grammar school that the water flows down. And we've, you've heard the suggestion that it's not the actual capacity in the basin because what we're really talking about is about zero to four feet, right? And we have a lot of freeboard, and the zero to four feet is actually not a lot of area, right? So once you get above that four or five feet, you have a lot of room for the water to spread out into, all right? So for 50 years, the water has been uh, uh, allowed to be a little bit higher. For 250 years and many thousands of years probably before then, we've had a Spanish lake, and it's always been used. It's always been used by Louisianans. Um, my first question is, why the rush? We've spent millions of dollars on a Shaw study that needs to be vetted. It's going to be put through a Corps of Engineers process. What's the rush if there isn't a large, large risk of flood, incremental flood? We've had, we've, it's been in this condition for 50 years. When you talk about destroying a business, you talk about the threat of lawsuits from another landowner, they've been in that condition for 50 years today. Alligator Bayou Tours is being destroyed, right? So what I'm saying is we have short-term and long-term decisions that we have to make. When you're making long-term, general, godlike decisions on the future of an ecosystem, <coughs> you have to be very, very careful. And I suggest to you moving incrementally is better than just draining the swamp. Because I think that this is an experience we have in New Orleans. We had all of New Orleans East was a cypress marsh before, before we had development. And now you still look in areas of New Orleans East that's not developed, and what you find is you find tallow and willow forests, you find trash trees, right? And draining the marsh now, that's exactly what you're doing. You're gonna allow the cut grass and the trash trees to get, uh, to get a root, and, and that's the concern. So, and I'm not an expert, so maybe I'm wrong, but because of the risk that you undertake, when you take such a severe action, it pays to go slowly. And so then I'd ask that the uh, capacity 
um, be left in the basin at least to a level that A, protects other, everybody's enjoyment and what you've heard, B, allows all businesses to thrive, and C, doesn't inexorably change the character of the basin by creating what is in essence what, what the Corps will call a fast land, which is a really a, a, a trash-free forest, some things that, that uh, you, you can't go back with Cyprus. It's very, very difficult. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just, just, just to clear up, sir. Sir, just to clear up, I did look at my notes, and, and you are confused. That's right. So uh, you did buy your time to the lower Mississippi, uh, oh, uh, Mr. I, Orr. I wasn't, yes. We didn't give 20 for 10. Sorry. Sir? Okay. Thank you for your All right. Um, all we got left right now is uh, if we don't have any other speakers, we we did have uh, the Hibberville Parish representatives coming in, and that. Uh, is that a rep? No, they're right here. Oh. Excuse me. <coughs> What's that? Yeah, what? Yeah, Come on up. Sorry, I came late. Okay. I, I didn't sign in. Yeah, we'll catch you afterwards. All right. Okay. Come on up. On behalf of Biberville Parish, which they have had se held several meetings and uh, to try to uh, discuss this issue, and um, We have Mr. John Clark, who is the Environmental and Permits Manager for Iberville Parish at the podium. We also have Mr. Lucky Sanji, Sanji, which is a CAO of uh, Iberville Parish. And we ha also have the Mayor of St. Gabriel. Mayor, please state your name. I, I forgot your name. I'm George L. Grace, Senior Mayor of St. Gabriel. I'm sorry, Mr. George. Okay. Uh, what they'd like to do is make a presentation to us and they will field questions from the board here. Thank you. Good evening, Council Chair and Councilman, uh, visiting guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to first start out by um, showing you all. This is uh, aerial photograph of the state of Louisiana. It kind of gives you an idea of the distribution of uh, water and waterways and forest land and coastal land. This is zooming in a little closer, zooming into uh, the Lake Pontchartrain Basin. And there is the Spanish Lake Subbasin. Zooming in a little bit closer, giving you an idea. This is Spanish Lake. Subbasin area. Getting a little closer, you can see the close proximity to I-10. And this is a slide that shows. It's kind of hard to see, but what this slide uh, depicts is that there's 33,000 acres of land that has to drain through the Spanish Lake Subbasin and out the out the Alligator Bayou floodgate. On Ascension side, there's some 6,000 acres that has to flow through the Alligator Bayou floodgate. This is an aerial photograph of the area, kind of giving you all an idea of what it looks like. Uh, the city of St. Gabriel is at your top right. It's not back in the uh, foreground there, not far too, too far back. The little white line is Spanish Lake. This is the Alligator Bayou Flats. Alligator Bayou, Bayou Man Shack, and the Alligator Bayou Flood Gate. This is a little close up. Alligator Bayou uh, naturally connects to Spanish Lake Subbasin with Bayou Man Shack. And this is the Alligator Bayou Flood Gate. You can see the flood gate is right there on Man Shack Road for some of you all who are not familiar with this area or what it looks like or what this is all about. That is the location of the floodgate and it's between Alligator Bayou and Bayou Man Shack. I thought it would help to give everyone a little bit of background uh, about 
what's going on at this about this area and uh, its natural attributes. Historically, uh, rising waters from Bayou Manchac backed up into the Spanish Lake subbasin through Alligator Bayou. After the Mississippi River levee con was constructed in the early 1900s, the Spanish Lake subbasin area experienced frequent and disastrous backwater flooding from Bayou Manchac, which connected to the Amy River. In 1951, the Alligator Bayou floodgate was constructed by the State Department of Public Works for the Iberville Parish Police Jury. And the operative word here is floodgate, not, not dam, not lock, floodgate. The intent is to keep water from Bayou Manchac from backing up and flooding the Spanish Lake subbasin, which the subbasin is a very, very flat, low area. A foot of water can spread out over hundreds of acres. Five feet of water, a thousands of acres. This is just, uh, we did a little background research, had to go to the state archives, and this is the document here showing the, the contract between the State Department of Public Works and the Iberville Parish Police Jury in 1951, where the State Department of Public Works constructed the Alligator Bayou floodgate for Iberville Parish. This is just an amendment. They are asking for a little time delay. They had a little time talking to Iberville Parish. Now, <clears throat> six years after the Alligator Bayou floodgate was constructed, the Ascension Parish Police Jury passed a resolution and sent it to the Iberville Parish Police Jury asking Iberville Parish to open the floodgate. You're holding it at four foot and it's flooding our timber and killing our trees. This is only six years after the floodgate was constructed. Ascension sent Iberville a resolution asking Iberville to open the floodgate because you're flooding our trees. More background continued in 2001. Uh, Iberville Parish was notified, notified by landowners that the closed floodgate is flooding their forest and preventing large-scale ecological restoration. 2001, Tropical Storm Allison hit. There was much flooding in the Spanish Lake subbasin and parts of Ellen Hunt Correctional F Prison and LCIW flooded. 2005, we had Hurricane Katrina and Rita. 2008, Hurricanes Gustav and Ike. Iberville Parish President ordered the floodgate open for hurricane preparedness. One thing I would like to mention is that during Hurricane Katrina, Iberville Parish President Uso ordered the floodgate open and got an outcry. And next thing you know, the news channel was there asking the parish president who ordered Spanish Lake to be drained. It was no intent to drain the lake. The intent was to prepare for the hurricane. Iberville Parish then uh, in 2007, landowners um, contacted Iberville Parish and threatened litigation that the, the standing water on their lands keeping the floodgate closed is damaging their property and we were threatened with litigation. So our parish president said, hold on, give us a little time. Let us write to the state and federal agencies to see what type of jurisdiction what type of information they could provide to us on regulating the water control, uh, regulating the water levels within Spanish Lake. We didn't get any response back. So Iberville Parish uh, began their own background research, history, scientific data, conducted field investigations, water level monitoring, review of water quality assessments, wetland jurisdictional boundaries, land parcel ownership, topography, current land use, and flood frequency. Now myself, I'm a biologist, wetland biologist. I specialize in water quality. I work for DQ and the EPA for 10 years writing watershed restoration plans. These plans were the steering mechanism for the state and federal funds that they would use to restore impaired water bodies. So, uh, we, we, we're not just getting started with this stuff. So Everville Parish conducted multiple field investigations <clears throat> by boat and helicopter. 
we verified the landowner's claims that the, the, the timber was in, in fact flooded. This gives you an idea of what it looked like uh, during Tropical Storm Allison. You can see the flood water uh, coverage. Uh, you look up, it's hard to see, but you can see in the blue the amount of water that was uh, faced to go out there and there's Hunt's Prison, the location of Hunt's Prison and the LCIW which it did flood. So anytime it rains, all of this water has to get out of the Alligator Bayou floodgate. Otherwise, this is what we're looking at. We got to get past this wall. And the whole area of St. Gabriel, uh, Carville, Point Claire, all of that land, some 38,000 acres, 33, 38,000 acres has to flow through this, this Spanish Lake subbasin and out the Alligator Bay floodgate. And if there's already five feet of water in the subbasin, it can only ha hold half that much more water before it, it's already half full before it even starts raining. So there's a, a risk, a high potential for flooding. These are some of the aerial photographs of the bottomland hardwoods that surround uh, Spanish Lake and throughout the subbasin that are inundated. This picture was taken on April 9, 2009. This is another picture of the flooded canopy, and you can see uh, you can see a lot of the green trees that are blossoming out this spring, but you can also see a lot of the uh, canopies are dying back. I would suspect they're under stress, and and it won't be long before they ultimately die. This is what we see in the residential areas. Uh, this photo was taken March 27, 2009, after a two-inch rainfall. This is just off of Bayou Manshack Road, Bayou Paul Road, back uh, in that area. There's some residents that live back there, and they, they have constantly experiencing uh, flooding. What's the elevation there? Bluff, this is the bluff bluff swamp block structure and one thing that we would like to point out is that this lock structure is between a levee that separates the bluff swamp and the Spanish Le the alligator bayou flats and it's a one-way flow valve that allows waters to be dumped from bluff swamp to alligator bayou thus more water into the Spanish Lake subbasin dumping more water into the Spanish Lake subbasin, one-way flow valve. This is what it looks like from the water, this one-way flow valve that's dumping water on Alligator Bayou from Bluff Swamp. So we looked at the water levels. We wanted to see what is the water level. We've heard that the water level's been at four. We've heard that 4.5, we've heard five. What has the water level been? Over the last eight years, you can see that golden line, it's b the water level over the last eight years has been at five foot. And uh, you can see the blue line, that's where the water level's been starting March 28th all the way to May 14th. So, a big difference. This is the, the water levels for Bayou Manshack, which would be the receiving, receiving stream, the stream that Alligator Bayou is, would be naturally connected to. You can see that the average water level over the eight year period is two foot. And you can see the blue line how it fluctuates. So we have Alligator Bayou at five foot and Bayou Manshack has been at two foot. What we're doing is artificially impounding high water inside of the Spanish Lake subbasin. Now I want to talk about the state lands. Alligator Bayou, the bottoms of the waters and the waters are state lands. The Alligator Bayou Flats are private lands. And all of the, ran the lands surrounding the flats and the subbasin are private lands. The only other public lands, state lands, water bodies is Spanish Lake and Bayou Broad. Those are state water bottoms. This is what it looks like 
in the Alligator Bayou Flats and the Spanish Lake. If y'all think this is good water quality or a healthy ecosystem, aquatic ecosystem, y'all might need to take a look at this again. This is hydrilla. It's taken over the entire Alligator Bayou Flats, the entire Spanish Lake. It's full of hydrilla, which is an exotic aquatic plant from Asia. It's no good for our native fish. It's no good for our native ecosystem. It creates a sterile environment, like a desert. This is Spanish Lake. The path that you see across Spanish Lake is created by surface drive boats. People going to and from their duck blinds. That's about all it can get through there. And this is in 2008, before the gate was even open. So we also looked at the water quality status in the Spanish Lake Subbasin. In doing so, we realized that the Spanish Lake Subbasin is connected to Bayou Manshack water body subsegment. It's a part of the Bayou Manshack watershed. And the designated uses, public uses, is primary contact recreation, which is swimming, secondary contact recreation, which is wading and boating. And the third use is fish and wildlife propagation. That means that the water body must support conditions for healthy breeding populations of native fish and wildlife. This gives you an idea here uh, that shows the basins throughout Louisiana and the Bayou Manchac watershed and Spanish Lake Subbasin is in the Lake Pontchartrain Basin. <coughs> it, it, it's connected to the Lake Pontchartrain Basin. The status of the Spanish Lake um, ecosystem, it's basically a wetland aquatic ecosystem. When I say wetlands, it consists of Cypress Tupelo, deep water wetlands, and bottomland hardwood forest. This ecosystem is severely degraded due to the constant impounding of high water in the watershed. It's causing water logging conditions, which means there's no oxygen in the soil for the plants to respire and breathe. That's okay for short periods of time, but for 24 seven, 30, 365 days a year is too much. Talking about the game fish and the ecosystem, the population of game fish is nearly non-existent. You'll be hard pressed to find a largemouth bass, bluegill brim, or sun perch out there. Most of the population is Asian carp, which is another exotic species from another part of the world. How it got in there, we don't know. Needle nose gar and shad. <coughs> the vegetation, native plants that would normally occupy the Spanish Lake subbasin are being dominated by exotic and invasive species such as hydrilla, salvinia, hyacinth, black willow, cut grass. I can go on and on. If y'all think that's healthy, I don't know. You mean <coughs> the water quality status? Spanish Lake is located, like I talked about, in the Lake Pontchartrain Basin. Water quality, water body subsegment 04201, according to the EPA and DQ. And if you look at e DQ and EPA's 303D list, f for the last 10 years, from 1996 to year 2006. They have showed that this water body subsegment is impaired. It does not support its designated uses. It's been impaired, according to their data, for 10 years. DEQ further goes in their 305B report to list the causes or what they suspect is the reason. And one of the reasons they suspect is flow alteration and hydro modification. Some of you all who want to look this up, you feel more than welcome to go to DEQ's homepage and look up the 305B report and the 303D list for water body subsegment 040201. The forest health in the, in the Spanish Lake subbasin, local bottomland hardwood forests are stressed and dying due to permanent inundation of high water. 130 acres of Cypress Tupelo Forest in the Alligator Bayou Flats is killed by permanent high water held by a floodgate. These flats are now open. 
covered with hydrilla with sparse cypress trees remaining, which does not support an abundance of diverse fish populations. This is what the Alligator Bayou Flats looks like with the high water, all of the high water standing. And at the top left of the screen is where Alligator Bayou would, would come into play from the Alligator Bayou Flats. You can see the green area on the water, that's hydrilla. If it's not hydrilla, it's hyacinth. Stuff that's not supposed to be there. And that whole area of open water used to be a dense cypress tupelo forest, a dense forest. We have an aerial photograph. We did some research on, in the archives on aerial photography, and this is an uh, aerial photo in 1998. If you look at the top right part of the screen, uh, it's hard to see because it's black and white, but you can see the evidence where the Alligator Bayou Flats existed. It's there. Come 1965, 1956, it's still there. It's hard to see. These slides are off the screen, but the, these aerial photos from 1933 and 1941 show the area that, that we saw as what I'm referring to as the Alligator Bayou Flats. These aerial photographs show that same area as being a dense forest. So in 98, something happened in 1956. Maybe it was because the installation of the floodgate or in oper operation of it or whatever. Uh, it created an open body of water and caused those trees to die and disappear. So, Everville Parish. Uh, it's a lot like Ascension Parish. Politics, uh, the government, their main charge is to protect life and property. Thank you all for that. But the residential land that it, that's within this subbasin is frequently flooded. flooded. Uh, for example, the areas around Bayou Paul Road, uh, the Highway 30 corridor, and the city of St. Gabriel. There's also industrial land, major and min minor petrochemical facilities subject to flooding. Forest land, large tracts of bottomland hardwood forest permanently inundated. Prison land, Eline Hunt's uh, Correctional Center houses 2,100 adult males, and the LCIW houses 1,189 females. And during Tropical Storm Allison, the prison flooded. Okay. Uh, we also have uh, some academic research centers, uh, LSU Ag Center, Reproductive Biology, and, and the Sugarcane Research Station. All of that is located in the S Spanish Lake Subbasin. There's 179 commercial, combination of 179 commercial, industrial, petrochemical businesses that are in the Spanish Lake Subbasin within Everville Parish. For example, uh, Entergy, Cosmar, Siva, Sagenta, Pioneer Americas, all of their runoff has to drain through the Alligator Bayou floodgate. Now we bring to a perspective here. Uh, we want to. I want to have my uh, co-worker co and the uh, parish chief administrative officer, uh, Mr. Edward Sanjay. I'm going to let him take over, and he's going to give you all a legal perspective. Uh, of artificially impounding high waters, artificially impounding high waters within the Spanish Lake watershed. Good afternoon, members of East Ascension Drainage District and Mr. Martin Day's Parish President, and Mr. Rue, Director of the Drainage District, and the general public. My name is Edward Sonji. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer for the Iberville Parish Council in Plaquemine, Louisiana. Protection of life and property from flooding are certainly proper functions of local and state governments. Iberville Parish, through its parish president, certainly takes drainage and flooding very seriously. I can assure you that on a weekly basis we address issues concerning flooding and drainage. Certainly I recognize that you also do that. You are the East Ascension Costello drainage, drainage District, therefore you have an huge task before you and you regulate the drainage in the East Ascension side of Ascension Parish. Once a government body undertakes revived flood control improvements in its parish in an existing basin, 
It, ha it has the duty to perform this function in a clearly responsible manner, which does not damage life or property of others. As Mr. Clark said, this is a floodgate that was installed by the Louisiana Department of Public Works and ownership was surrendered to Ibbleville Parish in the early 1950s. This is a floodgate. It is not a dam that holds back water. It is not a locking structure that lets boats in and out of a, a waterway. It is a floodgate. I had the opportunity to speak to many workers in Ibbleville Parish DPW. Some worked there as young kids in the summer for Ibbleville Parish. Initially, when this floodgate was constructed, Ibbleville Parish regulated the, the floodgate, the operation of it. These workers told me that this floodgate was kept in an open position. There used to be a wheel they would go turn it manually with the hands, a big wheel that they would turn it. Then when they had severe rains, they would go lock the gate, shut the floodgate. The sole purpose of it was to prevent backwater flooding from the Amy River. In 1994, the city of St. Gabriel was incorporated. Mayor Grace is here this afternoon. He certainly can explain to you his efforts at drainage, but I know he works hand-to-hand -hand with Parish President Uso to address the drainage concerns on the east side of the river. Civil Code article entitled 656, which is entitled Obligations of the Owners, states that the owner of the Serbian estate may not do anything to prevent the flow of water. The owner of the dominant estate may not do anything to render the servitude more burdensome. Basic Louisiana law is that the dominant estate is situated above, the Serbian estate is situated below. You cannot do anything to prevent the natural flow of water. Whether you be an individual landowner or a government entity, you still have to comply with Louisiana law. Simply put, the natural drainage waters must be allowed to flow in a natural state and nobody must take any action to prevent the flow of natural drainage or to increase the natural flow of water in the area. Civil Code Article 658 entitled A State Through Which Waters Run states that the owner of an estate through which water runs, whether it originates there or passes from lands above, may make use of it while it runs over his lands. He cannot stop it or give it another direction and is bound to return it to its ordinary channel when it leaves his estate. The operative words is that he cannot stop the flowing water. By closing that floodgate, you're stopping the flow of water, natural drainage patterns. Mankind can't do it and government is not authorized to do it. Plain and simple. The Alligator Bayou floodgate was designed solely to install to prevent backwater flooding as Mr. Clark has told you. It is not to circumvent natural drainage and artificially impound any water levels in any basin area. I have done a lot of extensive research in the jurisprudence. Some may agree with me, some may disagree with me, but I, I feel pretty confident in the research I have found. And a long line of decisions beginning in 1812 when Louisiana became a state, courts have ruled that a parish municipality is liable for its obstruction of natural water courses or drains and may be enjoined from interfering with natural drainage. The operative word is natural drainage. Before the Alligator Bayou floodgate was there, the water flowed freely during flood times and flowed out when it wasn't flooded. You know, the sole purpose again to reiterate was to prevent backwater flooding. That lock was not put there, floodgate, to artificially create any water level. Private property that li lies beyond the bottom or the bed of any river or waterway may not be inundated by action of a private individual or a government entity. Well, you're a landowner, certainly you don't want anyone flooding your property. The other landowners in the basin area do not want their property flooded. Yes, they have threatened the parish litigation. Yes, the parish takes that assertion very seriously. If any action of a private individual or government raises a water level so as to damage private property situated outside the actual bottom of the waterway, the landowner has the right to seek damages. By the same token, as good stewards of the public fisc, as Iberville Parish Council and yourself as the East Central Drainage District, when someone asserts potential legal action against you, you must weigh the pros and cons and you have an affirmative duty, it's incumbent upon you to take all aspects into consideration and preserve the integrity of the public fisc and not subject yourself to 
lawsuits and litigation that can damage your public fisc. According to the state land office, the public waterways in the east side of Yellowville Parish, as Mr. Clark had told you, are Alligator Bayou, Spanish Lake, Bayou Bro, also Bayou Manchat. The waters from and East Sibleville from the Mississippi River levee all the way to the point at Carville, those waters all flow through Bayou Blow into Spanish Lake, into Alligator Bayou, ultimately through the floodgate structure into Bayou Manshack, in the Amy River, Lake Poncha Train, ultimately to the Gulf of Mexico. That is a natural pattern of drainage that mankind and government is not supposed to interfere with, plain and simple. Here you see some photographs. The top photograph, I think, was in April of 09, when Iberville Parish flew over in a helicopter. And you can see on the right is, I guess, what is called Bluff Swamp. On the left, there is a levee that was built there, I guess, by the Pontchartrain Levee District, East Ascension Drainage District, many, many years ago. On the left, you see the, the massive water there. Alligator Bayou runs along that levee. In the bottom photograph, you see it again, I think it's in May sometime. You see the alligator bayou in its natural channel. All the water to the left of that natural channel is privately owned property. Beyond that is also thousands, thousands of acres of privately owned property. By closing that floodgate <clears throat> and artificially impounding water to flood private property subjects the parish council to potential litigation. Parish council does nothing to interfere with the natural flow of drainage water. That's not our intent. We want water to flow naturally. I'm sure Mayor Grace wants the water to flow naturally. And he will follow me after Mr. Clark has some more brief statements and he will demonstrate to you clearly how keeping the floodgate closed impacts the city of St. Gabriel. In summary, government individuals are not allowed to artificially impound water at levels that cause damage to private property. People have a right to use their property without being damaged by the government. If they want to grow timber and cut it, that's their right under Louisiana law to grow timber on their property. We as government cannot interfere with that. Government and individuals are not authorized to artificially stop or prevent or interfere with natural drainage of the water. Water flows naturally. Flood gate is closed. Natural flow stops, ceases. Louisiana law says you can't stop the flow of water. It will be a parish that's going to apply with the law. Iberville Parish has a duty to protect its public fisc and not subject itself to damages from potential landowners for flooding and damaging their property. Now, if someone wants to flood property, will they be a government agency like yourself or Iberville Parish or some landowner? Go buy a flood easement like the government did in the Monte Carlo Spillway Flood Basin or the Magansan Floodway. I read an article today. No flood easements, you're still on your property, you can still hunt fish, you can still use it for recreation. You know, government has no right to deprive people of the use of the property that they own. If someone feels a drainage easement is needed to hold flood waters, then someone needs to purchase that from the landowner. Iberville Parish will await the study from the Shaw Engineering Group. I think it's going to come out in the latter part of this summer. At that time, hopefully Iberville Parish will again meet with Iberville East Ascension Drainage District and we will go from there. But I can assure you now, until that study is completed and Iberville Parish Council and the East Ascension Drainage District and Parish President Martinez meet, the floodgate will remain in an open position so as to mimic the nature, the natural flow of water. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Okay, we've got a little bit left, just a little bit more left. Um, we're going to close here. Um, okay, considering all of that information, we did our field work, we did our water quality background, we've background everything that's taken place, the existing conditions, the water levels, the law, Based on all of that information, based on all of that data, Iberville Parish President 
ordered Alligator Bayou floodgate open March 24, 2009 to stop the artificial impoundment of high water within Spanish Lake Subbasin. Iberville Parish's intent is to protect life, property, and the environment by helping to restore the natural flow between the Spanish Lake Subbasin and Bayou Manchac, except when high waters from Bayou Manchac threaten to flood the subbasin. This is what it looks like now. Uh, this is the Alligator Bayou floodgate. You can see the floodgate is at the water level. The water level at this time was 1.3 feet. You can see how the floodgate was constructed. You can see that the water level is on par with the way that it was constructed. You can look at the throat of the floodgate. Otherwise, if it was at five foot, they'd have had to construct this floodgate underwater. This is on Bayou Paul. Bayou Paul is a main tributary that flows into the Spanish Lake Subbasin, which all water, that supports a big part of the drainage in Iberville Parish. You can see this, this gentleman here, you can see at the top, that was the, the previous water level. That was where the water used to be. Now you can see at the bottom, that's the current level. So you can see that we have gained some five foot storage capacity in water. <coughs> Oh, and by the way, today is beginning of the season, hurricane season. Today, it started, so we're ready as we can be. Uh, this is a letter I'd like to point out that we received from Honorable Mayor Grace of St. Gabriel. Uh, he noticed the effects right after we opened the gate. They had a two-inch rainfall that came. He said he's never seen the water drain out of his town like this before we've ever opened a gate. He's never seen the water like drain like this and he really appreciated that because he's been having to deal with standing water and mosquitoes and all of the other things that come with that. <coughs> now, uh, for some of y'all that, that, you know, may need to look at Iberville Parish, we are good stewards of the environment. For those who don't think that we are, maybe you should go see what we're doing in the Atchafalaya East Watershed Initiative, where three parishes have signed a cooperative endeavor agreeing to restore the waterways in that area, and each parish put up $30,000 of their own money. And with that, we've leveraged a million dollar grant from EPA, and it just sets the stage for the next best thing to come. You also need to look at what we're doing in the Atchafalaya Basin Program. <laughs> We are also in the Atchafalaya Heritage Trace. You need to look at our Sherburn Wildlife Management Area, the Atchafalaya Wildlife Refuge, and also our Keep Iberville Beautiful affiliation with Keep America Beautiful and Keep Louisiana Beautiful. So our intent is to protect life and property, but also in Iberville, but also in Ascension Parish and East Baton Rouge Parish. We want to stop artificially impounding the high water that's flooding the private property without permission and without compensation. Uh, we want to help support the Clean Water Act and DEQ's water quality management plan. We also want to support the Army Corps of Engineers wetland protection and their wetland mitigation criteria. <laughs> and we also ultimately want to help restore the Spanish Lake ecosystem and to increase public use. This is what we're talking about. Hooded warblers, painted bunnings, ospreys, squallowtail kites, yellow crown night heron, woodcock, starks. These are some of the game fish we'd like to see in the basin. Largemouth bass, sun perch, bluegills, alligator gar, stoneflies, mayflies, caddisflies. And I'd like for you all to hold your questions, but uh, I'd like to welcome up uh, Honorable Mayor, uh, Mayor Grace from St. Gabriel. He has some uh, pictures, some real-time pictures he would like to show you all of what's going on in his, his area. Thank you very much, Mr. Clark. Gentlemen of the Drainage Board, uh, 
thank you for the opportunity to come before you to say a few words. I uh, come uh, on behalf of the citizens of San Gabriel as well as East Iberville. I come with the uh, parish delegation because we are united as uh, we confront this particular issue. For the last 15 years, I've been mayor of the city of San Gabriel, Louisiana. I've been a citizen of, of San Gabriel all of my life, and uh, I'm very, very uh, familiar with uh, this whole area. Uh, San Gabriel is an area which is 96 miles, 96 square miles. It's a large area, and it is drained by Bayer Brook, which goes into the Alligator Valley. For years, the citizens of San Gabriel has protested the fact that the floodgate, when it is closed, cause a lot of damage to their properties and, and, and their living environment. What basically happens is, whenever we have a rain, any substantial rain, we have what is called ponding all over, all over in various uh, segments of San Gabriel. And I have gone everywhere to try to seek a relief. I've gone to the, uh, at, to the federal level, to the Department of Conservation. I've tried to, uh, to, to get funds to, to, to actually uh, perform dredging operations in, in Bayer Borough and, and, and other places, in its tributaries. But the bottom line is, when it rains in San Gabriel, Bayer Borough fills up. And all of the uh, ditches and all the other other things, other other tributaries that drain into Bayer Bro, can't drain because the Bayer is already full. Now, what I have here, this gentleman uh, was telling me that uh, the, the the recent uh, emergence of cut grass, I think he referred to it, uh, was causing the fact, causing the, the, this this drainage problem in San Gabriel. What I have here is <coughs> photos that I, yeah, I have quite a few photos, but that was taken on uh, 12th month, 30th day of 2006. As you can see, in various parts of San Gabriel, you have flooding in people's yards and residences all over this town, both in the Carville area, uh, 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 Morris Street, Monroe Lane, in the St. Gabriel area, uh, Smith Street, uh, Elliott 75, in the Sunshine area, Besson Land, Bayer Land, Ravier Land, we live with these conditions and have lived with these conditions for quite some time. Uh, during the time that the hurricanes occurred, this of course uh, uh, magnified those things. And uh, as, a, as a city, we have various projects. Uh, we're trying to improve our streets. We're trying to improve, uh, develop subdivisions, and just as you've done here in Ascension Parish. This kind of, uh, uh, of condition which, 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 which exists discourages investors from coming in and develop a subdivision when you know that you can't control, as it has been, uh, the, the water flow in Bayer Bro. And Bayer Bro meanders throughout East Iberville. The whole thing is drained by this one bayer, bayer bro. And it, unless it is allowed to flow freely, it will, we will never be able to solve the drainage problem there. Uh, uh, three pipes were, 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 were installed in, in this, in this uh, 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 area. Draining water from the bluff into uh, the uh, alligator by you. And uh, we weren't consulted on this. This is this was a one-way deal that water comes out of the bluff into St. Gabriel, into East Iberville, and we were never consulted. It, it was bad enough that we had to deal with uh, the the uh, uh, fact that by your broke could not flow freely. Now we have an additional water coming into this basin. So uh, we have a real problem with, with uh, not uh, allowing this water to flow freely. It has caused a lot of damage in San Gabriel. It inundates our streets. It causes us to have to spend a lot of money in trying to just keep up rather than to get ahead. So uh, that's our position. 
We are not talking about, we are talking about people's residence. We're talking about people's lives. Uh, we, I'm dealing every day, not with, and, and I'm not, I'm not uh, 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 at all uh, uh, anti-anything, but I'm dealing with the actual people who are living in this area who are having problems with their properties from day to day, especially when it rains. Recently, since that floodgate has been opened, we had a two-inch rain or better, and I have, as, as my letter stated, I have never seen in, in recent years, and I've been living over there a long time, water leave out of our areas as quickly as they did. There was no ponding, and the water was able to just go straight on out. And of course, that makes my life easier, but that's not the main <laughs> thing. The main thing is the health and safety of our people was enhanced by the fact that this floodgate was open. Thank you very much. And I have a lot of more pictures of you all want to see. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Good job. OK. Uh, Councilman, uh, if, if you all have any questions, I'll be more than glad to answer your questions. So, uh, Mr. Valentine, it's your district here. Yes. Mr. Clark? It yes. is Mr. Clark, right? Yes, sir. One of those last pictures we saw, do you have some data telling us what the floodgate was, what the, what the level was of the floodgate at that time? Uh, no, sir, we do not have any, but uh, these are real-time pictures brought from the mayor of St. Gabriel that he took out in the field on 12 well, early 2006. I, I, guess, I guess my point is, is you telling me that Spanish Lake locks, because they were closed at that time, caused that flooding? Or was uh, that, or was what that we're saying result? is that if there was water already in the basin, it was less likely to be able to, these waters to, would struggle uh, to get out. It would be more difficult for these waters to get out. But the water level that you're asking for, I could certainly find that uh, because there is. I'm interested in knowing. Mm -hmm. Sure am. Look um, at that for you, sir. And now, you, now you say you are a parish employee? <coughs> yes, sir. How long have you been a parish employee? Three years. Yes, you were hired to do what? Environmental and permits manager. I left the state of Louisiana to come to work local on the ground with the people because I was promoted because I thought I did what I did well into a position where I was supervising and I felt like I lost touch with what I like to do. And so therefore I come to work for the town that I live in. Right. We don't have such a position doing this morning. No, no, I didn't think we did. Um, I, I'm just curious that the need that Iberville felt to have such a position. Iberville has uh, a very, we don't have the residential area, we don't have the urban uh, areas that other parishes, surrounding parishes do, but what we do have is the majority and the largest amount of green space, which makes for a very unique, interesting strip of land to look over as far as natural resources are concerned. Uh, we're talking the Atchafalaya Basin, which is not, that's world class, uh, and all of where the land meets the waters, we have an abundance of natural waterways, and waterways is my forte, and so therefore, this the ultimate place to work. Okay. Um, one of the things you mentioned early in your presentation uh, was the fact that uh, when this was constructed in 1951, uh, I think you mentioned that uh, Ascension Parish, of course you reiterated the fact that it's a floodgate. Right. But yet ever since it's been built, it was used as a holding situation because you said, uh, and I don't have your direct quote, but you, you mentioned that you guys held, Iberville Parish, held the level at four feet. And we requested, the Ascension Parish had requested and said something to the effect that you were causing some damage or someone was called, the landowners had said something about the damage at that time. So I, I know the gentleman, the attorney before, mentioned he talked with some people that said they used to go out there and turn a wheel. But in my investigation, I haven't really found anywhere where the locks have ever been opened and left open. I would like some of that information, if you have that in, the, in some kind of archives of Iberville Parish too, because it's my understanding uh, from what your presentation said that the state of Louisiana, DPW, built these locks yes, at your, you guys' request, Iberville Parish, and that they started being on the closed side to prevent the water from coming in. Uh, but obviously they maintained a level and have maintained a level for more than 57 years. But really, any, well, any kind of problems 
until recently. Now, I've just been on this council and this commission for five and a half years, and this is really the first time that Iberville has ever approached the drainage board, and as far as I'm concerned, have ever approached any of our administration with dealing with a problem. Mr. Nesmith has come and, and approached us because he was hired by landowners to develop a plan, I guess, or convince us that we needed to, to, to let the land uh, go dry uh, simply because, in my opinion, for federal mitigation plots, which this is what is all this is about. It's not about the ecology of the place. It's not about how many fish are going to live there. It's about federal mitigation plots, which means money, which means people have property and they want to use it. And I understand that. But so let's let's talk about exactly what the problem is. The problem is if we're so want to get along, then why don't we just close the locks like it's been for the last 57 years and leave it at four foot, three foot, three and a half feet until the study comes out. I don't understand why the parish of Iberville wants to keep the locks open as our parish president obeyed the order that Mr. Urso uh, put down since he is, manages the, uh, the drainage uh, uh, a commission and he decided he wanted to open. He didn't come to us and ask us whether we wanted to open or not. He did that on his own as, as Mr. Urso and whatever you guys have presented him before. So my point would be, what is the problem? If it has been a problem for years, then what is the problem with us leaving the locks closed and managing them as we have done, the Parish of Ascension has done for years since you guys didn't want to do them, I'm assuming, because we have always managed the locks as far as I can remember. Uh, why can't we do it that way? What, 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 what problem does that present? The problem is, uh, despite how it was operated in the past, whether it was right or wrong, uh, from where we see it, it was wrong, now that it's come to our attention, now that it has come to our attention, and now that we've gained, gathered all of the information and facts that we can, and we realize that what we're doing is damaging private property and other people's property and keeping them from being able to benefit from it just like anybody else. And then myself, after I look at the ecology, <coughs> the water quality stand status, I look at the wetlands, I look at all of the wetland mitigation banks out there, and there's more, there's already mitigation banks out there. In fact, there's a mitigation bank on the bluff swamp side 40% of which is on spans over to Alligator Bayou side. Those wetland mitigation banks have criteria, and it's not all about making money. It's about restoring wetlands to where they can function and provide benefits to the watershed. Cut, keeping the gate closed is cutting or severing the hydrologic connection from the Spanish Lake <coughs> uh, subbasin to by man shack and any of the benefits that, that those wetlands and that subbasin can provide to the Bayou man shack subbasin is being cut off and all you're sending down by your man shack is pulses of flood waters containing uh, dying uh, exotic vegetation for those residents living on Bayou Man Shack, I, I wouldn't appreciate that either. And also for East Baton Rouge, who has to deal with way more drainage than what we got to deal with, well, naturally the waters from Bayou Man Shack would back up into Spanish Lake Subbasin, keeping it closed and holding water already in there will not allow that process to occur. So we're also harming East Baton Rouge Parish plus Iberville and Ascension. That's why we're doing what we're doing. And the decision just come up because we, we it, had we known this before, had it come to our attention before, we'd have done something about it earlier. Okay, back to my question. Okay, so you're saying you won't open it now till after the study. That's what the comment you made. I so didn't say that I want to open it after the study. Well, I you didn't said say you, nothing you, about you the wanted, study. You wanted to keep it open until the study was presented. But what you're telling me is you really made up your mind already, and you want to have it open no matter what the Shaw study says. No, I wouldn't say that, sir. Okay, well, I guess then it goes back to my problem. Why don't you just compromise, and Hibbleville Parish just compromise, and allow Ascension Parish to close the locks for our constituent, for our business person, who who you have put out, essentially put out of business, who has ran a very good operation, who took a place of ill repute 
of lawlessness, turned it into an educational facility, has had a lot of benefits, has been on NBC, has been on ESPN, has put a lot into this. He and Mr. Raglan have put a lot into this place. But yet you guys don't have a problem with putting him out of business. Now, I wonder if that would be the same if the shoe was on the other foot and it was on your Iberville and we put you guys out of business whether you feel with the same way I do. I'm, I'm, I'm upset about it. I think that you guys should have compromised. I wasn't invited to meet, and I didn't expect to. Mr. Mr. Martinez is the guy that 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 uh, negotiates for the parish of Ascension. I wouldn't have done what he did. I would have made you guys make me open it, but that's my opinion. But point being is, why can't you compromise with us and allow the gates to be closed? That's my plea. That was my plea to Mr. Martinez to go back to parish president Urso, who chose not to show up tonight, and that's fine. I'm sure he had something else he had to do. But the point being is, uh, we, we just want to compromise until the Shaw study comes up. We'll, we'll abide by anything that we can work out in that time. But to just open the gate and let it drain as it did and to see these horrific pictures. And I've been in uh, uh, the swamp. In fact, some of the problem has to do with the siltation. That is actually coming that Iberville, it's silted his own bias. Bro Bayou, all that's coming from Iberville Parish. In fact, uh, the first time I met Governor Jindal, was at uh, uh, Mr. Frank's uh, 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 place where uh, the governor, myself, and, and Frank drove. We couldn't get to Spanish Lake even though the governor wanted to go there because it was silted in so bad he couldn't do it. That's another major problem. Why can't we work together in the future to try to do something to improve the drainage by uh, working together, sharing some costs to get the get the uh, bro by you dug out and the alligator by you dug out. Why can't we do it that way and work together and not run the gentleman completely out of business? That that's what that's my problem. I have. And and I I would I would hope that you guys would come back with some kind of proposal instead of just saying well, since you parish, you have to open the locks. And there, there's no common ground here because that's what you guys did. It's devastating to see that place. I I was there as a teenager. I've been in this parish all of my life. I caught crawfish right there. I caught bass in Alligator Bayou before. Bass will grow. Okay. I'm not as good as bass fisherman as I used to, but I used to look for millfall because that's where the bass stayed. But it has the water has to be deep enough for them to be able to grow. I'm not aware of one bass tournament that's been held in the Spanish. I, I didn't have a tournament there. Don't have a tournament. I used to I used to fish there a long time. I didn't say anything about you a get, tournament. <laughs> Can I? Ask? No, I just. Anyway, uh, my my comments are: um, please work with us. Please do not. Uh, uh, allow it to open. Uh, I'm asking you as, as a commissioner, I'm not asking you as a, all, at least all commissioners have their own opinions. I'm asking you as a commissioner that this is in my district the, to allow the locks to be closed, the, the water to be maintained somewhere around four foot until the Shaw study comes out with the Pontchartrain Levy Board. We had plans in place. I worked with the Pontchartrain Levy Board. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Blaine Sheets was the, the, the representative of our, of our area at that time. Uh, they had a lot of plans involved. That's how the Shaw report started. And uh, there were some big improvements, a new set of locks. We had a lot of things planned to help that area. And now I wouldn't blame the, the, the Pontchartrain Levy Board for not spending a dime on it. Why should they if we can't even uh, come to an agreement on whether we keep the locks open or closed and protect people's property? A paying taxpayer of, the ascension, of ascension Parish. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Yes, sir. Councilman Lohr. The one question I wanted to answer tonight uh, was something that many folks here referenced in their comments, and it, and it was why now? Why, why did we feel the need to uh, open the floodgates uh, at this point in time when it's been operating as it has for, as Councilman Valentine said, almost 58 years? Uh, I, I do think there are valid arguments that you've presented. Um, but my number one concern is for the environment and for uh, the, the landowners and the, and the people as far as drainage goes. So y'all aren't the experts. Maybe you are. Maybe you're not. Mr. Bonifay may or may not be an expert. Um, and his business may or may not be impacted 
uh, negatively with whatever the positive train levy district study says. And if it is, you know, then I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm going to follow the, the, the recommendations of that study because I think they are they will be objective. But why why did we feel the need to do this right now? I guess that I still haven't gotten a good answer. It, it's to me, it seemed like. This is a very contentious issue, of course, and this besides the, the rhetoric was getting more and more heated and the nuclear option was exercised. And I, I just can't fathom why when we're months away from a, from a study that uh, will possibly provide the compromise. I just refuse to believe there's not a compromise, I guess is what I'm saying. There's not to say that there's not a compromise uh, in the future, and, and this has never been never been about alligator by putting the alligator by you swamp tour out of business or injuring that business because in fact we believe that they do a great job at shining a light on the environment but it's it's not about that it's about life and property this has come to our attention our back is against the wall and we have to do something about it and we just entered hurricane season we've been through that before and like, like you've heard from some of the other people that's been out there during Tropical Storm Allison, during the hurricane, and the experience that we had during Hurricane Katrina and how the public outcry was and, and misinterpretation of what we were actually trying to do to help the area. They thought we were trying to hurt the area. So why now? Uh, it, it had nothing to do with the Alligator Bayou facility. It had nothing to do with that. Uh, why now? Why not earlier? Why not later? We we done it at this time. That's why we did it. I mean, I have no I, other clear answer. Uh, again, I guess it just makes it hard to approach uh, a, a compromise and get everybody around the table when the nuclear option has been exercised. <laughs> that kind of incites things and doesn't lend lend it to working things out. Uh, and so I, I just think that was a poor the decision. Other, the other position is that we could leave it closed and we could hold artificially impound five feet of water back in there and it continue to do the, the type of, have the impacts that it's having on the, on the sub-basin. Uh, you know, ecologically, it's not the best thing for the environment. For those who think that's such a beautiful area, y'all need to get outside more because it's actually because it's actually an ecological it's actually an ecological disaster and i'm not saying that there's not some val um some validity to those arguments i mean i'll i'll, I'll give I'll, I'll give you that it strikes me as a little ironic is that this where this is this whole discussion is around a man-made structure uh which is which is changing the way nature intended it so i'll give you that there's there's some validity to that but again my point is this we're months away from a study that can give us action uh you know action plan and result uh, and results of that will, will will lend itself to a compromise and we wouldn't have had to be in this this situation so I just think you're playing hardball, and I, I, I don't appreciate it. I, I appreciate that. Okay. Any other comment? Mr. Shake Snyder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm a former uh, teacher of Louisiana history. I taught science. I've studied a great deal about uh, ecology and and spent a great deal of time in the swamps. And uh, like George, I, I've been to Alligator Bayou when, when bass were biting and uh, caught uh, fish there as a young boy. And uh, But it has changed dramatically since then. I think this is a very complicated issue. It's not a, not a very simple issue. It's not an issue of whether we open or close the gates. I can promise you that. It's a lot more complex than that. Uh, I'm going to ask, you know, these next uh, few months, and I already have, I'm going to ask some serious questions. Uh, I'm going to try to be as objective as possible uh, in dealing with this, but I, I feel very much like uh, Councilman Lord did, is, is that the, the timing of this is just, um, it, it's just hard to comprehend. Um, not that I believe the lock should be open or closed or whatever. Uh, uh, you know, we, we've changed this situation, uh, but uh, we have decided uh, years ago, we had, de we had decided that we were going to uh, clear out uh, that area and, and uh, dredge out the, the canals and the bayous uh, to promote drainage and, and have this. Um, 
We changed the ecology of the whole thing when they put the locks in in 1951, and it will never be the same. Uh, but you can't just put a lock in there and then just walk away and leave it open or leave it closed. Either way, it was going to have some adverse effects. Uh, and, and, and I'm very much a proponent of what uh, Frank and Jim and them are doing because they, they uh, educationally would bring kids there. Uh, I've been there many times. I've assisted them in actually <coughs> moving buildings there. So I'm, I'm very pro for then ha having that activity. Uh, I, I, but I'm not sure that leaving the locks open is, is, is the best thing to do either uh, for the, for the long-term ecology of the whole thing, of the whole ecosystem. Because the facts are, right now, trees are dying. Mature trees are dying in that whole system. Cypress trees are not regenerating, and that was the cypress swamps, and they're not regenerating. We've changed the natural cycle. And if we're going to put, as, as human beings and as government officials, if we're going to put uh, a dam there, virtually, or some locks, then we have to try to also, if we're going to take that responsibility to stop flooding, because if you read all the history books, Galvez flooded out years ago. They couldn't maintain a, a community. The area around uh, the bluffs and all flooded out. They couldn't maintain communities at that time till you, there was a reason they put that. But once you do that, you have to do everything else to maintain that. The locks cause the sediment that stopped the natural flow coming in and out, that, that, uh, that allowed you to have boat traffic in and out, that would have allowed to, the, the swamp to be able to go dry and still operate. Because by nature, a swamp does have dry periods and does have wet periods. They all do. If you go to the bluff right now, and I think the area, I think Frank on the other side of the, the, the levee uh, is another swamp there. The locks are open. It's very... Uh, very ecologically sound swamp is very healthy. So one thing or another d d does not change the ecology of this. Uh, the, just one thing, doing one thing. So it is, it is very complicated, and that's why uh, I, I agree with Councilman Lohr that we need to wait for this study. Uh, the same thing happened when people wanted to prevent flooding along the Mississippi River. They created these big levees, and now we're finding that that's not the best thing, out, you know, because we're losing the the wetlands, we're losing everything else because we don't have fresh water flowing over there. And we're seeing the same things happen here. Uh, this area, I, I was afraid of this a long time ago because this area has been degrading for various reasons. Once we started putting the locks in, it was changing. And we then become stewards of having to manage it. And that's where we went wrong. We put locks. And we, all we decided to do was open and close some very small locks instead of having some laws. they woefully inadequate. They do not present the natural <laughs> flow. And I'm sorry, I disagree with you that we're mimicking the natural flow. Having a couple of, of uh, culverts there that allow some water to go through very slowly it does not mimic the natural flow, does not allow for the natural vegetation to grow. Uh, neither does closing it off. <coughs> so. Uh, there's some validity to, to both sides and, and make sure everybody understands that this is just not a simple solution. Uh, I, I, I very much we were, we were supposed to clear these waterways earlier. We waited for the study, as George said and as Chris said. And, and I would just plead to you, and I know Mayor Gray has uh, uh, spoken with you a number of times, uh, you, you have your flooding problems and, and we appreciate that. But to be this close, we, we stopped the, the dredging of the canals, which the Drainage Commission was going to do, because we wanted to wait and see what happened with the study, if that was the exact thing to do. Because all of these people you see right here want to maintain this basin in a natural and healthy uh, situation. All of us want to also. But to say that there's one way to do it, and, and I, I, I think that's wrong. I think we need to wait and have the experts tell us what to do. And I think in the meantime, uh, doing something that is going to put a very viable uh, business out of business, uh, an educationally sound uh, group of people, is, is just a negative thing. And I, I, I would hope that, uh, that there would be some compromises there and that we would wait. But also, more than that, when we finally decide what's the correct structure there, 
and how we're going to open and close it that we take into account that we're going to mimic as much as possible and maintain this area. And it takes more than just putting something there and forgetting about it. You have to do things and you have to spend money. And hopefully, since it was mentioned that Baton Rouge has a great deal of drainage problem and Iberville has a great deal of drainage problem, that we're very open to commingling some funds to maintain this great basin, which I don't think there's anything else close to uh, a very inhabited area like Baton Rouge, uh, Gonzales, and Ascension Parish, and Iberville, that you'll see anywhere else in the world. It's a very special gem. But it's going to take money for the next 100 years to maintain. And uh, I, I think that that's what we're missing, is that we, we need to make a pledge to go back Co-mingle some funds, form a group that's going to be for this basin and do what the scientists say that you can do to maintain the ecology and then do what the engineers say that you can keep people from flooding over there. And then hopefully we can have Mayor Grace's town drain properly and we can have uh, Frank's business educate the people around here and people can go back to catching bass in Spanish Lake and alligator bayou. Uh, and that we can see some cypress trees growing back. And we can have these hardwood forests and bottomland forests grow back because we're losing them. And that's just as important as anything else. That's education. And it's also educational that for kids to see that, 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 that swampland does dry up. It does have periods of, of wet periods. And, uh, and all of these things need to be seen. And so I, I, I would hope that in the long run, that that's what we're here for, not just deciding whether we're putting gates or not. So please uh, compromise so we can get past this period. We can keep people in business. We can wait for the study to come out, and we can do things in the long run. But I, but I ask that you be a champion of getting Baton Rouge involved, getting Iberville involved, and come to the table where, uh, like everything else, it's, it's funding that it takes to maintain these things. And I think it's well worth it. I think the will, people are willing to pay for it because once it's gone, it's gone. And uh, I don't want to see it gone. I want to see it maintained for my kids and my grandkids and everyone else. So uh, with that, I would hope that you would uh, agree with Mr. Valentine and Mr. Lord that you compromise and you allow this to be open until the study comes out. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. So Any other questions from any commissioners? Thank you, Mr. Clark. Parish President Morton is. Yes, I, I want to thank uh, Lucky and Mayor Grace and John for coming out tonight, uh, explaining the Everville side of this uh, problem that we're having. I think we've pretty much all agreed. We, we did uh, uh, meet uh, Thursday as a group uh, with the landowners and uh, Randy and Bill and uh, Lindsay on our legal side and we discussed all different options at that meeting and and hoping to come to some sort of compromise but uh, again we didn't but we did at least come out of that meeting with one thing that uh, we're going to work with the Pontchartrain Levy District and Shaw and uh, we're both going to uh, hopefully go along with their recommendations when it does come. Uh, You've heard tonight and was reiterated at the meeting Thursday that uh, Iberville Parish has jurisdiction over the locks. They have jurisdiction over the. I mean, we cannot open or close them without their uh, permission. Uh, that was an agreement that was done, I think, when previous <laughs> parish president uh, Marshawn was in. That uh, every on on a monthly note, there was supposed to be meetings, and on uh, during times of strife for hurricanes, uh, uh, emergency events that uh, it was supposed to be, uh, uh, m you know, meetings on a daily basis and uh, weekly basis as needed. So, again, they, they kept control over those locks and, and speaking with, with legal, uh, we really didn't have a choice there. So, it would be easy to say, okay, uh, Iberville Parish, we're not going to uh, adhere to what your demands are. But I don't think we'd get anywhere. We're just making a statement. We can make that statement without going through the legal process. Uh, I think there's room for compromise here. Uh, I think there's things that, that 
can be worked out. I think if, if this bayou is dredged, uh, everybody will be happy. I think Frank can continue with his business. I think the ecology uh, would be better. Uh, but again, we have to, to remind ourselves that, that we're looking at a business here as compared to people's property and people's lives. And um, I can understand Mayor Grace's uh, problem. We have flooding problems here in Ascension Parish also. So again, if we can dredge that canal, that will also give you more of a storage when the water does come down uh, and help you. So uh, I'm hoping that we can all work together. I think East Baton Rouge Parish is an integral part of this. Uh, I, I don't think we just we need to look at the, the flooding problem and the drainage problem, but we also have other problems. I mean, we got uh, a lot of different chemicals coming down uh, from the Baton Rouge area, uh, waste, the people fertilizing, and uh, those those waters, uh, I guess, for the past 10 years uh, have not been that healthy. So again, we got a problem that we need to work with Baton Rouge, East Baton Rouge Parish, Iberville, and ourselves, and uh, we don't need to just, we don't have to just look at it from that standpoint, from a flooding, but from also from an environmental uh, standpoint. And I think some of the recommendations that the Shaw Group's uh, gonna make are gonna address those things. So again, I, I, I'm hoping that we can all work together, come up with a solution, and, and I think that that's uh, what everybody's wanting to do here. I don't think uh, if a parish has any anything to gain by, uh, I had any malice toward anyone. Uh, I, I think in, in the meeting Thursday, everybody agreed. Nobody's trying to put uh, Mr. Bonifay out of business, although it appears that way at this point, uh, and, and it's getting done. But hopefully, if we can get some rain, it's been a dry period here, uh, and restock the basin with water, but also allow St. Gabriel to drain. Uh, that you know, we can have some time between now and the time the study comes out. But again, when the study comes out, we're still going to have that problem of how we're going to fund this. So uh, we are looking at what the cost is going to be to dredge this bayou at this time. And we're going to come up with the price and uh, hopefully we can get with uh, Iberville Parish and uh, East Baton Rouge Parish when we find that out. And hopefully that's one of the recommendations that the show group comes up with. Uh, but with that, uh, I just want to thank you all for coming tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you, President. Mr. Kluwer. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mr. Kluwer. Yes, Mr. Valentine. Um, I, I listened intently with Mr. Mr. Lohr's uh, explanation also, and, and I think that uh, we ought to give um, Iberville Parish and its parish president and its administration an opportunity. So I offer a motion, a, a resolution, uh, to uh, close the locks and maintain a water level at four foot uh, until such time as the uh, Shaw uh, report comes out and we can have some deliberation over that. And uh, to me, that would be a, uh, a simple compromise that uh, Mr. Bonifay, a resident of Ascension Parish and a taxpayer, can continue his business. I second that. We have a motion by Mr. Valentine to offer a resolution to Iberville Parish Requesting to close the locks, maintain a level four foot. of four feet until such time that the Pontchartrain Levy District reveals their report findings for that area. We have a second by Mr. Shake Snyder. Any discussion? Any opposition? We're down to, we got enough for voting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Resolution passed. Thank Motion you. passed. Right now. I would just like, I would like a quick second to close on this and uh, not to be rude to anyone, but they had someone sent a note up here to question one of the Iberville Parish folks. Ma'am, I sincerely appreciate you and respect you, but one of the things that they came here tonight was for to address this board and answer questions from this board. We sincerely appreciate it. I'm sure this won't be the last opportunity for you to come forward and ask a question and or <coughs> whoever it is, it was a lady. And uh, so 
Uh, I'm sure that Iberville has meetings that that folks can attend also. Uh, on this subject, I, you know, sitting in several meetings on it, I just feel a bit remiss that uh, the East Baton Rouge Parish um, uh, just, I guess, just make make everybody understand that uh, Ascension Parish doesn't own Bayou Man Shack, nor do they own all of Alligator Bayou. Okay, there's a third parish involved in this. I don't know what's going on at their meetings. I do know at the uh, summary meetings for the Punch Train Levy District where uh, the Shaw Group was given interim reports and basically doing some fact finding and gathering from stakeholders that they did have somebody there. But, uh, you know, so we're, we're just Ascension Parish. We're down on the lowest end of that run along with East Baton Rouge Parish. So, you know, just get East Baton Rouge Parish a little bit more involved in this issue basically when they when we open the locks at alligator bayou or whatever it's just also an east baton rouge parish issue and uh i want to thank everybody for being patient here tonight it's been a long subject i think everybody's views are pretty much heard even if everybody particularly wasn't heard um and so you know this issue's not over with and we'll continue to move forward thank y'all well, let's move on to another agenda item. Move to agenda item number seven, drainage port reports. Mr. Roof. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Uh, get down to some, uh, some of our monthly reports. As always, you'll have some of the reports uh, in front of you for us work orders. You want to wait a minute? Bill, yeah, let's, uh, let's, okay. let's, uh, you want I would like to, uh, the, the chair would entertain a motion for a five minute recess in the meeting. So moved. We have a motion by Mr. Second. Valentine, second. second by Mr. Cullen. Any discussion? All in favor? Sure. This meeting will be recessed for five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Move to reconvene, Chairman. We have a motion to reconvene the meeting by Mr. Valentine, second by Mr. Dempsey Lambert. Any discussion? Any opposition? Motion, motion, this meeting is reconvened. I'm getting tired. <laughs> All right. Let's move right on to item number seven, drainage reports. Mr. Rue. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, uh, commissioners. <coughs> Weed control. We cut uh, 39 miles, spray 24 miles, labor crew cut, uh, hand cut. 6.3 miles and inmate crew 5.5 miles. Uh, digging, four miles of uh, di ditch maintenance. And uh, regular drainage, Muddy Creek at uh, Manchac Harbor. That's uh, the erosion project. We're having to put it out for rebid. The reason is the, uh, the the lining of the pond was put into the bid, the original bid. And if we did that, it looks like it would have been in the $80,000 uh, range just for the pond and we could not separate it out so now we are rebidding it without that in and we're going to uh, use hopefully use midnight clay uh, in-house the uh, maintenance of that pond without the lining and save a good bit of money we're trying to do that right now but it is being re-advertised for a bid um, pipes on the railroad tracks was done four weeks ago uh, we didn't have time uh, the last meeting to announce it but the um, uh, it seems like it's working well. We haven't had much rainfall yet, a couple of times, but uh, it should uh, be a major uh, factor in those two areas. Monticello Ditch, we started that work. Uh, we have one right-of-way issue remaining, but we're going to go ahead and dig the ditch up to that point, and hopefully by that time we'll resolve that right-of-way issue. Dutchtown Gardens uh, Subdivision Drainage, uh, we have sent a non-compliance uh, letter to the developer saying that no uh, certificate of occupancy will be given to any of the houses in there until he solves that problem. So that should get him off the center line and, and moving to f toward a resolution. Comments concerning, uh, I need to make a few comments concerning subdivision and rear drainage servitudes. Uh, this is a, a, and has been a long-standing issue with the, uh, with the drainage district. 
And for that reason, it was uh, the drainage ordinance was put in place, and we must follow the drainage ordinance. As for the drainage ordinance, rear, swe rear swells and subdivisions are not to be encroached into or covered in any way as to prohibit the drainage uh, through that system. Uh, anybody putting culverts or, or uh, structures or anything within that those swell ditches are in, um, uh, I guess, violation of the ordinance. We cannot bend on this issue. Once you bend, you might as well tear up the ordinance. <coughs> Therefore, you know, everybody listening, and, and we're going to try to get the information out to everybody. Look at your plat. On the plat, when you buy a piece of property in the subdivision, it will be in there that uh, you shall not encroach into the rear servitude. And in our drainage ordinance, it specifically says swell ditches are open ditch and remain open ditches. In the new ordinance, we should resolve some of those issues, but as of right now, that's what we have to live by. And again, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty cut dry on it. And I'll be glad to answer some questions and finish a few things. Um, bridges, uh, that's the other thing. Pass around the uh, bridge policy. This is another issue that uh, has, has been, uh, I guess, has arisen from time to time as to what is our policy, and this is just for informational purposes. I won't go into it tonight, but I, I would uh, ask that each council member uh, read the policy. Uh, if there is problems with the policy, let's change the policy. But as, that, as the policy remains in effect, let's follow the policy. Uh, I, I would ask that you um, uh, understand the policy when you're talking to someone that makes a request for a bridge. Again, this could get us in a lot of trouble if, in fact, we vary from the policy because then, in fact, it's no longer a policy. So please, uh, I ask for you to read it again. And if you have any questions about the policy, please give me a call and I'll be glad to explain it to you. Um, major channel improvements by you, Francois. Uh, of course, digging has been completed for a few months now, but we're still removing spoils from Bayou Francois. We're still removing spoils from Black Bayou, and the same thing with Marty Burat Ditch. Uh, Bayou uh, North Seas, uh, we renew, not only removing some spoils, but there are some bad spots at, uh, along the bank line of Bayou North Seas that contain some uh, hard uh, concrete um, objects and glass and some other things that came from the bottom when we initially dug it and removing those bad, that bad dirt and replacing it with some good dirt. Bird Island Ditch it has been uh, started and we are progressing well with it. We do have a few right of way problems and, uh, but we decided to go ahead and do as much as possible while we're resolving the, the, the several right of way problems that we do have. Shadow Creek, same thing. We are um, moving with wetlands determination of right of way and engineering is, is in progress. Uh, again, on that is the right-of-way issue on a couple of tracks, and again, we are going to resolve those issues uh, very soon. Hopefully, if not, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to dig where we can while we uh, resolve the other issues. Major capital improvement project, Law Ridge Levy uh, clearing and grubbing. It's about 75 percent complete, and we are on schedule. Henderson Bayou. Uh, on, on the Law Ridge Levy, uh, uh, existing Law Ridge Levy, we are uh, trying to complete the right of way acquisitions on that and, uh, and moving steadily toward that. By the time we're ready to really start construction, the right of way issue should be resolved. Henderson Bayou, we're awaiting uh, engineering proposal uh, from the engineering firms to uh, negotiate. We will look at each, both with uh, Henderson Bayou and Marvin Road uh, Pump Station Addition. We are uh, treating this as a brand new contract with the engineers where we're going to review their submittals and uh, negotiate with them for its compensation to take it from this point to the end of the, of the project. On the uh, pumping station enclosure, uh, we're waiting for a few uh, changes in the, uh, in the um, specifications that should save us some money. Once we resolve that, the contractor should start uh, the mobilization of that project. Engineering, um, we're waiting on engineering reports on Ball Bayou, extension of Law Ridge Levee, and Panama Canal, Bayou, uh, Conway, Lake Pontchartrain Basin. All of those uh, reports are on, on the track and in progress, and we should be getting uh, most of them toward the end of this year. Muddy Creek Bridge at Muddy Creek, we're requesting RFQs for the engineering 
of that uh, project. Once we get the, uh, we convening the, um, the committee to review the RFQs. Once they get it, we hopefully by the next meeting we will have uh, that uh, pretty much done. Where we can have a recommendation for the engineering firm to take that project. The NRCS project for debris removal. Uh, we have less than 90 days to bid it. Everything's on course to, uh, we're in the permitting process right now. We should have everything in place to be able to bid it uh, within that 90 day limit, less than 90 day uh, limit. And that's pretty much my report, uh, Mr. Chairman. If I have any, have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Yeah, on the NRCS, you said that uh, you're in the permitting process and within 90 days you should be going to bid. Well, we have to have all of this done within a, uh, less than 90 days. But right. from 90 days from the time they signed the contract was about a month ago. So it's less than 90 days. But uh, in talking with the engineering firm, all should be um, in hand by the time that that limit is up and we're able to go to bid. All right. On the, uh, on the capital improvement projects. Yes, sir. That, um, and moving forward, I just, I just want to... Uh, I ask y'all to work diligently on moving this forward, keeping us abreast of it, to uh, get get these projects to the ground. Yes, sir. On the major projects. Yes, sir. And the administration is working toward because of the fact we're moving toward the or have moved toward a professional service contract, engineering contract um, uh, for services. We are uh, voiding all the old uh, task order contracts that was in place when these engineers were first hired. And we're going with this selection and with the uh, the new contract specifically for each project to take from this point to the end. And we're going to actually look at it as a brand new project and negotiate the uh, percentages and the and the and the compensation to the engineers. Uh, like I said, just as if it was a new project. Thank you, sir. Any questions, Mr. Lohr? Um, Mr. Rue, on the culverts in the uh, rear swale ditches, um, completely agree, of course, that's the law in the books. If people are violating that, that we need to uh, force them to remove it and, and abide by the law. But you mentioned something about the new drainage ordinance. Is it something we can work towards, like a, a permitting process, like we allow for roadside well, ditches if, you know, we go out there and we guide them on and, and sign off on what the type they need to buy? Is there something, what, what's the cons to, the, to move the in that new direction? Yeah, uh, Councilman, the, the new uh, drainage ordinance, uh, for, as for subdivisions, is rec recommended by drainage and accepted by the Planning Commission that all subdivisions in the future that's coming for uh, or for acceptance will is mandated that all lots drain to the road. I mean, that the entire lot has to drain to the road. That means the rear of the lot is the highest part of every lot. And that's in that case, your road ditches has to com has to accept or be able to have the comp the uh, capacity to accept all the water and take it to the drainage structure, your, your your detention pond or whatever. And in that way, and then each lot would have to have side uh, the, the the ability to take that water from the back to the front, but it's up to the developer to 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 to, uh, to crown that uh, that lot from side to mm -hmm. side to be able to take it to the front. But in that case, then we won't need, actually need a drainage servitude in the back, back of the lot any longer. Okay. And so that would negate all the problems we've been having for years for fences and mm -hmm. the servitudes and everything else. Um, again, this has been worked on by the drainage department and by the planning commission, and we seem confident that this will solve some of our problems. Good, great. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, two other questions on, uh, or well, one's just a comment, and it's on Monticello. I appreciate that. I know that's, that's been a problem for for a long, long time. So I uh, appreciate us moving forward on that. And uh, the man shack, um, the pond with the lining, is, are we confident that the clay is going to be a sufficient replacement for the liner? I know the liner is expensive. Absolutely. I mean. Well, at, at this time, we're looking into it. Now, we get to a point where we can get a liner for the same price as the bit night clay. We're bidding on a bit, bit night play, uh, clay now, or at least getting quotes on it. We're never going to go with a liner if, in fact, it's just about the same cost. Uh, we're trying to get the bulk rate on bit night clay. I would say that the liner would be definitely the better choice, even though it was more costly, if we were seeing a noticeable, um, um, I guess, uh, a lowering of elevation of the pond. In other words, every time you go out there, it was two or three feet lower. That's a major, uh, um, uh, I guess, uh, loss of water through the soil. Um, that's not happening. The pond is really not losing that we can tell much water at all. if, if if it is, it's only an inch or two at a, you know, mm -hmm. over a, a good period of time. 
So what we're uh, thinking that is because it's not a drastic loss, uh, bitnack clay would uh, certainly uh, solve that problem. And uh, so and that's why we're looking at it. And if it's less costly, it would be the better thing for us to do. And it's easier to do by our own personnel. Uh, but however, we're going to get all the facts before we go one or the other. Uh, we don't want to tie this up though with the uh, which what, what happened tied up with the uh, the fixing of the um, of the erosion control of the bayou itself. We want to go ahead forward with that and get it done, and that's why we decided to rebid it, take that out, okay. and go forward. Okay. okay. Thanks. Any other questions for Mr. Rue? Thank you, sir. We'll move right on to. Agenda item number eight, authorization to cost share with the parish, Roddy Road Bridge Replacement, Shadow Creek and Bird Island Ditch for 50% of 353839 Yes, sir, we're asking authorization to cost share with the parish for that replace those replacements, uh, both at Shadow Creek and Bird Island Ditch, not so to exceed 353839 Motion by Councilman Johnson, second by... Uh, Councilman Todd Lambert. Any discussion? Yes, Mr. Shake Snyder. Bill, what's the what's the total cost of those? Seven hundred and. In fact, I should have a copy of your. Uh, it's in there. Seven hundred. Yeah. Okay. Seven oh seven. Last six sheet seven email. Seven oh seven seven uh, six seven eight eighty five. So it's just a fifty fifty. It's a fifty fifty. The structures themselves. When I looked at the bid document. The structures themselves. Uh, just the cost of buying them is uh, a little bit over the 50-50 share. So actually, it's a better for us to go ahead and just call share at 50-50, and it's easier to do. Mm -hmm. well, I want to thank you all for, for making those structures large enough to handle all that. Too. Motion to adjourn, Mr. Chairman. Same. Well, wait, wait, we Same thing, Bill. I want to compliment you all on getting this wait, stuff wait, moving wait. forward. Well, from what I understand, talking with Mr. Fairchild, they're ready to move on this this month, so hopefully we'll have this done while school's out. We won't impede any of the traffic. Any, uh, especially during school. Before we adjourn, I just want to thank the administration, the staff, and thank fellow board members for your patience tonight. We have a motion by Mr. Todd Lambert to adjourn. Second. Second by Mr. Lohr. Any objection? Being adjourned.